Good morning, everyone, and hello, chairpersons. My name is Kiran Preet, and today I'll be talking about nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in Salmon Laos. So these are the five beautiful faces and the brains behind this project. So including me, Stian and Raina Roshberg from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences included in this project. And uh, from the industrial partner, we had Lucien Rufiner and Anuk Sar, who did the Xenopus assay. So I'll go into that later on. So yes. So basically what I'll be presenting today is already published. We have recently uh, yeah, written the manuscript and then it's published in PLOS Pathogens. So whoever is interested in deep diving, please, uh, yeah, it's openly, uh, it's open access available research article. So where we have, what we have done in this project or what is uh, published in this article is the X, Y, O expression of a functional non-hybrid heteropentameric receptor. Sorry for this confusing or very long title. So basically it's the, for the first time we are successful in producing our, a functional receptor which is a non-chimeric. So whole soul coming, all the subunits coming from the Salmon Laos. So talking about neonicotinoids, as we all know, these are the most widely used insecticides in the whole world. And they are also used against uh, agriculture pests, arthropod vectors, as well as ectoparasites. So when we are talking about ectoparasites, we cannot forget about our little friend, Salmon Laos. So talking about new nicotinoids in Salmon Laos, so uh, recently, or last year apparently, the Actosan vet uh, was licensed uh, a, a chemical treatment against Salmon Laos in Norway. So what is this drug? It's basically imidacloprid, which is the uh, active compound, and this is a neonicotinoid. And uh, this is a chemical treatment that got introduced after 10 years, so which itself is like kind of, uh, okay, alarming thing that it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, resources, money, time hour, to develop a chemical treatment or any kind of treatment against this nasty ectoparasite. So, meaning thereby, we should use these treatments which are quite handful and not like multiple ones available. So, so far, this is like the one which is effective when we talk about just the chemical treatments. So, we should use them sensibly. Why? So because we want to have the prolonged life of these treatments and not kind of repeating the mistakes, specifically when we are talking about the chemical treatments, because we know that Salmon Laos is a very uh, clever ectoparasite and it develops resistance like this. So when we talk about the sensible uses in order to prolong the life of these chemical treatments, what we mean by that? To understand the drug better. So how, to, how it acts on this parasite, how it kills a parasite or paralyzes a parasite. So to do that, we need to go deeper into the basic science, how it acts on the parasite or which proteins or the target proteins or the ion channels, so where it is going and interacting inside the parasite. That leads to the death of this ectoparasite. Yep. So the knowledge that we had before we started this project came, as I said, uh, from the vertebrates. So what we knew before we started this project, that neonicotinoids, they, their natural transmitter is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, they target this neonicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So these receptors, they sit on the postsynaptic membrane in the cholinergic synapses. And they occupy, or uh, their binding site is very much similar to a natural neurotransmitter of these receptors, which is acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is produced in the presynaptic neuron, then it moves into this synaptic cleft, binds to these receptors, that leads to the opening of the channel, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, 
channel is open that leads to the influx of the cations. Either it is uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, or sometimes calcium ions. So basically cations, which leads to the transmission of the stimulus from this neuron to this neuron. So this acetylcholine is hydrolyzed by uh, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, which sits in the synaptic left. And then this leads to the stopping of the stimulus, which passed from the presynaptic membrane neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. OK? Then when we talk about the neonicotinoids, as I said, they occupy or uh, they have overlapping binding site on these receptors similar to the their neuro, uh, natural neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. But these neonicotinoids, they do not get hydrolyzed by acetylcholine esterase, meaning thereby they will bind on the receptor, so the channel will open, there will be an influx of the cations, but there is no one to stop because they are not getting hydrolyzed by the enzyme. So this stimulus will keep on passing on from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. That leads to this neuroexotoxicity, which was shown by my colleague yesterday, like how they like become crazy. And then that leads to the paralysis and the death of the organism. Here in case the salmon louse. So then talking about the stoichiometry, as I said, it is a heteropentameric ligand. Oh, sorry, the, uh, channel, oops, the channel. What is happening? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so it's a heteropentameric channel. So it consists of the alpha as well as the beta subunits. So here you see the purple color is for the alpha subunit and then the light blue color is for the beta subunit. So these subunits, they form, uh, yeah, they sit together next to uh, each other and form this, uh, or the ligand binding pore is in between the alpha and the beta subunit. So the ligand interacts or binds here in between the alpha and the beta subunit, and that's how it leads to the opening of the channel and the influx of the ions. So here is the 3D structures, kind of the possible stoichiometry, how when we talk about like the three-dimensional structure, how these alpha and beta subunits possibly will be sitting next to each other forming the pore or the ligand binding site. And here, for example, is the possible acetyl acetylcholine binding site between alpha 1 and beta 1. But this is, again, is a possible stoichiometry because we didn't have this information from the arthropods. So that, that was, was the aim of like uh, why we wanted to do, do this project because there was scarce knowledge on the arthropods. We had very limited knowledge like how these alpha subunits, they are present in Salmon Laos, how many are present, how they bind and form this stoichiometry and how these new nicotinoids actually interact or whether they interact, that was also not sure, whether they interact in Salmon Laos with these uh, with the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, or I'll just say N receptors, as it was cleverly used by one of my colleagues yesterday. So then, uh, yeah, and then previously, it's not like we were the first ones who thought about that. There were previous attempts by researchers to form the native or this series, uh, to form the functional receptors from other arthropods, but the attempts were failed in order to, yeah, and then the uh, yeah, combining both the alpha and beta subunits from the same species from the arthropod, it was not possible. So the successful cases that happened in arthropods, so they used this chimeric approach where they used alpha a subunit from a vertebrate and beta subunit from the invertebrate or arthropod to have like a hybrid uh, end receptor to have it f functional or yeah, in the Xenopus uh, oocyte or in the XYO expression system, I'll be explaining more about this XYO expression system in the later slides. So there was not even a single native end receptor available in the arthropods before we started this study. Not even in Salmon Laos. 
And then it was even more important because we knew that studies were ongoing on using the neonicotinoids as one of the chemical treatments against salmon louse. So as I said, in order to not repeat the mistakes that have been done in history, we wanted to be on the forefront to know uh, and understand the mechanisms of the drug as well as the its possible uh, interactive like uh, receptors in the salmon louse before that was like as a, uh, or licensed. And we are lucky and we are happy that we did that before uh, this imidacloprid or ectosan vet is available in the market, at least in Norway. So that was the aim to obtain a non-hybrid, non-chimeric, fully functional end receptor in L. Monis. As I said, in order to understand its native structure, stoichiometry, function in the ectoparasite, and how these uh, neonicotinoids, they act on these receptors. And finally, to use it as a screening tool before actually we dump these chemicals in the ocean, this could be a very valuable screening tool to use it first in ex vivo to see how these drugs, they react and are able to, or then that could be used uh, in the in vivo later on. So then, what was our strategy or the way forward? So in order to uh, have any functional receptor, we need to know what are the genes that are coding for the different subunits. So what we did is like we used the conserved sequences from other organisms or other arthropods, specifically insects, and then to get the full length cDNAs in using the L. salmonis genome. So we got the full length cDNAs in the salmon, uh, in salmon louse. And along with these alpha and beta subunits, we also got the full length cDNA and the putative protein sequences in the sea lice. So these ancillary proteins are the RIC3, UNC50, and UNC74. So I would like to share with you, like this was kind of the secret behind like how we were successful in getting this uh, non-hybrid functional in L. salmonis because these three proteins are really important for the assembly as well as for the receptor to function. So once we got these full length cDNAs and the putative protein sequences in salmon louse, what we did, we did the multiple sequence alignment so what is multiple sequence alignment is to get the whole putative protein sequence and compare it with the other arthropods to see whether these are uh, the sequences, the protein sequences that we got in the L. salmonis, whether they fit in these ligand category. This is because these uh, end receptors, they belong to the cis loop li uh, ligand family. So there are certain specific conserved sequences or the domains that should be present in order to call these proteins that yes, they belong to this family. One of this is the N-terminal sequen uh, terminal sequence, which is here, boxed here. And this cis loop, so which is basically like these 13, uh, two cysteine residues separated by 13 amino acids, and these two are just sent cysteine residues. And apart from that, there are many, so it is just an example. So these specific conserved sequences are present in all the members of these lichen family. And apart from that, again, it is an example of this RIC3 ancillary protein the conserved sequences which should be present in order to classify this protein as a RIG3, which is conserved across the species. So once we got these uh, putative protein sequences classified as yes, we got the correct protein sequences, what next? So we want, uh, so the next step was to see their phylogenic relationship with the other species, specifically the arthropods, to see and then to classify them as like, because we got like the alpha subunits as well as the beta subunit, but it's not only just one single alpha, it is like alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and so on. So which one it is? So in order to classify them correctly, label them correctly, and in order to have their phylogenic relationship with, we, with the other organisms, specifically arthropods. So we ran this phylogenic, uh, with this phylogenetic tree, 
So as you see, like from the alpha one from the Salmonis, it clustered very well together with the other, for example, DMAZ, Drosophila, Milanogaster. So it clustered with the other alpha one subunits from other arthropods. So yes, this could be labeled as alpha one. And beta one as well, it clustered nicely with the other beta one subunits from other arthropods. So yes, beta one. But there were some exceptions as well with beta-2, even though the l is beta-2, it clustered well with the Drosophila beta-2, but uh, from this Ms. mellifera, it was alpha-8. So what it shows that what we have in the literature, it is not like written in the stone. There are certain exceptions. It could be because of the evolutionary species-specific evolutionary changes, or it could be due to some mislabeling. So yeah, so this phylogenetic tree, it helps as well as a multiple sequence alignment helps to get like, uh, to be more sure about what you call these subunits as. Then what's the next step? We got our putative protein sequences, we got, we got them labeled. So what next is to see what we got in silico, does it fit in the X vivo system? Can we get a functional receptor with these receptors, uh, oh, sorry, with these uh, subunit uh, proteins as well as the ancillary proteins that we got. So for that, we use this expression system called the Xeno, uh, Xenopus oocyte system. So this beautiful lady here. So this has made this, uh, yeah, gave us a very uh, useful tool for the, especially for the uh, voltage-gated or the ligand-gated ion channels. So this Xenopus, or it's female frog, so these are the eggs or the oocytes, so basically the unfertilized eggs from this female. So the size and robustness of these eggs is the key factor why this has become a, such a successful tool to uh, learn and uh, study more about these ion channels. So each egg is one millimeter in size and they are quite robust like when it comes to the handling while injecting these RNAs or cDNA, uh, cDNAs and then while putting the electrodes on the membrane of each individual oocyte to uh, read the currents. So the size as well as the robustness of these oocytes or unfertilized eggs, we could use this as a tool to study these ion channels. So what is basically the recipe is that you have to have a cDNA that is like, yeah, outside the lab, do uh, produce it cRNA, and that cRNA from each of the subunits that I have mentioned, along with the ancillary proteins, got injected into the oocyte, and then, Oocyte is like, okay, it will help you in doing the translation, modification, and all that stuff, and it will give you a protein or a functional receptor on the membrane so that it's easy to read or uh, read the currents, like producer uh, using the two voltage-gated clamping system that I will explain in the next slide. So as I said, the eggs, you have to produce the cRNAs, or it can be either used with the cDNAs, but then you have to target the nucleus, which is, could be a bit tricky. So with the cRNAs, you can just inject the cRNAs into the cytoplasm, and then the, uh, the oocyte will pr produce the proteins or the functional receptor, if you're lucky, on the membrane. And then you can use this two electrode voltage clamping technique, which I guess will be explained more by my colleague Marit later on. Uh, to read the currents. So if you get the current in presence of a ligand or any compound, for example, neonicotinoid in this case, then if you get the current, meaning thereby this ligand or the compound is interacting with the protein which is getting expressed, here in this case, this N receptors. So then uh, we got in uh, Salmon Laos, we got alpha 1 to alpha 7, so five alpha subunits and two beta subunits. But we don't know which of these uh, subunits will result into a functional receptor. Either it is everything we have to inject and that will produce a functional receptor, or is it like a different combination of this alpha and beta subunits 
along with these ancillary proteins that will give us the functional receptor. So for that, the technique that was used by our uh, industrial partners, Lucien and Ong Ongu. So to determine like which of these combinations, so first they used, so this each black bar is representing the L, uh, alpha and beta subunits, like here, this first one is alpha one, the second one black bar is, or the box is alpha two, and these gray ones, these are the ancillary proteins. So you see here, like, in almost all the different permutations and combinations, these ancillary subunits were used, or the proteins here. So as I mentioned, like, this was kind of the secret key, like, these are utmost important if you want to have a, a receptor, a functional receptor. So then, as I said, like, first, everything was injected into the oocyte. So yes, we got the current because everything is there, so at least the ones that are needed to form the functional receptor will be present. So then it's like kind of exclusion strategy, Rem start removing one by one or two by two to see if we get still the current or not. So in the second case, like, yeah, ancillary proteins are present, but this beta one and beta two were removed, no current. So that gives the clearance like, okay, beta subunits are important for the functional receptor. Next one, number three, Ancillary proteins are present, beta subunits are present, but all the alpha are gone, no current. So at least some of these alpha are important for the functional receptor. Next fourth one, ancillary proteins are gone, all the alpha and beta are present, no current. Confirming these are really important, and so on. So what these boxes are showing, like we got the current at least in these two combinations. So here, Alpha three is present along with beta one and beta two and the three ancillary proteins that give nice current in the xenopus oocyte. And here, both the alpha one and alpha two were present along with beta one and beta two and the three ancillary proteins. So these two combinations, they give nice currents, meaning these two can form functional receptors. So we call these two combinations, the first one as L, L salmonis and SA. So I will call just R1 and R2. So this is R1 receptor, this is R2 receptor. So two combinations. Then we wanted to know whether it is the ratios of these alpha and beta subunits that will play a role in changing or giving a different stoichiometry. So why stoich what stoichiometry here I mean is like the different orientation how these alpha and beta subunits will bind and form this ligand, uh, this receptor, sorry. So then in this case, there were two ratios of alpha and beta uh, subunits was tested. So 10 is to one and one is to 10, so other way around. So you see here in the case of R1, the, uh, at different concentrations of uh, acetylcholine, the natural uh, neurotransmitter, there was no difference in the way the current was produced, meaning thereby the stoichiometry remained the same, irrespective of what ratio was used between alpha and beta. But when we looked at R2, the 10 is to one ratio gave different picture, as opposed to one is to 10. So this is again like the summary like uh, from this graph. There was a nice overlap between what these current recordings and uh, there was a difference. So what it tells us that might be R2 receptor, it forms two different receptor subtypes, meaning thereby there are two different stoichiometries. Possibly we have, uh, yeah, we have to further look into this one. But possibly there are two different receptor subtypes when we talk about R2, based on what is the ratio between this 10 uh, alpha and beta subunits. So uh, it is not like an unusual thing with these neonicotinoid uh, receptors. It is a very well-known phenomena in vertebrates, especially in humans. And when we talk about the most common uh, N receptor in human brain, actually this same uh, uh, scenario is observed there. Like when these alpha and beta subunits, they are put in different ratios, they result into different 
stoichiometries are different receptor subtypes, and that changes their affinity towards their natural neurotransmitter, here in this case, for example, acetylcholine. And even that affects their pharmacological profile, that is their affinity towards different compounds or drugs. So that is a known phenomena. So, oh yeah, sure, I'm almost done, yeah. So talking about the pharmacological profile of these two receptors, this R1 and R2. So here we screened a series of compounds, both from the neonicotinoids as well as the non-neonicotinoid group. So the green ones here shown, they are the non-neonicotinoids. So the R1 and R2, they were quite similar when it comes to the non-neonicotinoids. But when we talked about the neonicotinoid compounds, there were differences. Specifically, if you see, uh, yeah, so these red bars, they show the new nicotinoid compounds that were screened for these receptors. So when we talk about this number six, which is thycloprate, and then number eight is imidacloprate. So important, number eight specifically, because now we have a licensed uh, chemical compound, imidacloprate or ectosanvet against the lice in Norway, so it's very important that uh, this compound reacts only to R1 and not to R2, because we didn't get any signals here, or, uh, yeah, uh, currents. Yes, so that then that was the X, Y, O thing, so we wanted to see what happens in the real life on the real parasites, so the X, Y, O, in Y, O validation for this one. So for that, uh, the picture was uh, like all the seven neonicotinoids that were tested on pre-adults in pre-adult salmon louse, they had quite good effect in killing these parasites. So good affinity, except for this thiamethox, yeah, whatever, yeah, this one. So yes, uh, and there is a reasoning behind that because this is known to be broken down into clothiadenine. Yeah, I don't know why people label them so difficult, yeah. <laughs> Easy name, so this C1, yeah. So might be because of that reason, uh, this we didn't get any uh, effect of this compound because the active one is this one. And then as you see here in the X, Y, O picture as well, number seven, so you see an effect of this one. And then for this number nine, there was no effect. So X, Y, O, yeah. I mean, we got the similar result both in the ex vivo as well as in the in vivo. So to summarize, for the first time, we got a fully functional non-hybrid native end receptors in L. salmonis. And uh, for the R1, I'm sorry, oops, that was quick. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so the key recipe, or the key secret was that we needed the ancillary proteins for the function for the receptor to be functional, and then this study provides a great screening tool where we can test it on different compounds before we actually dump them into the ocean, as well as on the non-target species, for example, honeybees, because these are known to be really targeted by the neonicotinoids getting negatively affected. So yes, it provides a great screening tool. Thank you.